Это, да, в эфире минус. А тут, конечно, это достать. So our subject is the frequency responses of induced current and magnetic field caused by this current. I took the simplest, simplest model and I risk to I do it because I know it has many general features, universal features for all cases. Let us start. First of all, let us return back to this model. In the current loop, induced current arises. In, in the conducting loop, induced current arises. It's very useful mentally, mentally, imagine that there are two currents. Two. Simply not one, uh, but two. Taking into account that in most electromagnetic methods we measure quadrature in phase component, it's very useful to think. Simultaneously, I have here two currents. One current changes as A sinus omega t. That's its amplitude. That's here dependence on time. According to Bill Savard law, at this point, somewhere where we measure, it creates which component of secondary magnetic field? Hmm? So, here there are two currents, A sinus omega t and B cosine omega t. My question is, this current creates magnetic field? It does create. It creates according to Biosavar law. Therefore, which component? In phase. In phase component of current does create in phase component magnetic field. Quadrature component of current creates quadrature component of magnetic field. So we see that frequency responses of quadrature in phase are completely different. Therefore, magnet quadrature in phase component measured magnetic field is usually completely different. It depends in different manner on frequency, on time constant, and later, I will share with you and show you it, it has completely different depth investigation. So even in re the same receiver, the same point, the same coil, the same meter, which measures simultaneously quadrature in phase component, it doesn't mean it's the same. One of them has one dependence on frequency, para time constant, even depth investigation. Another completely different. It's not too bad to understand. And I will, as I can, I will show you, or I start to show you today this, some of these differences. So let me look in frequency responses, quadrature in phase component. Did I say clearly a few seconds ago? So at each point, there are two currents. One of in phase component of current does create in phase component magnetic field. Quadrature create quadrature. And both of them have completely, usually completely different dependence on frequency, parameters of the medium, and also possess completely different depth of investigation. Let us realize this fact, it's used, it's simply used, it. it's not theory, it's very well used. Now, used by industry, mining, logging, many, many places. So, let us start to consider these responses. First of all, 
at low frequency part of spectrum, we have qu in phase compan amplitude of in phase component of current or magnetic field. Let us say current. Rest is very simple because of our law. Is equal primary amplitude primary flux divide inductance times omega square tau square. Correct? And what about quadrature amplitude quadrature component? Primary flux inductance omega tau which is bigger in quadrature component is always bigger. And that's the reason why we, if we are working at low frequency part of spectrum, we mainly measure quadrature. And if we can, we also measure in phase. Now, I will explain this dependence after some time. But first of all, I instantly would like to emphasize one fact the, about which I mentioned a few minutes ago. Both components, quadrature in phase component current or magnetic field, doesn't matter, depends in the same manner of time constant or not. In phase component, that's amplitude of in phase component, correct? That's amplitude of quadrature. Do they depend on time constant in the same way? Or no? Or no? At low frequency part of spectrum, mag uh, magnetic field, quadrature component magnetic field, current cause, which causes it, this component, directly proportional frequency and time constant. In phase, always proportional square of frequency and square of time constant. So let us assume for a second we have two targets, two uh, targets, which differ by time, con time constants. One time constant, one millisecond, another time constant, four millisecond. What would be the difference between anomalies if we measure quadrature component? No, quadrature. Four times, if it's a four, I took the ratio four time constant. If the same frequency, if the same frequency, they differ four times. What happens within phase? Six times. So in phase component at low frequency part of spectrum, smaller, more difficult to measure. However, however, it's much more sensitive to change of parameter. That's important. And we will see how it works a little later. Then, let us look what is going on with increase of frequency. As quadrature component frequency increases, for example, quadrature reaches always maximum, not when omega tau equal one for real conductors. For real conductors, not one for contour, one. But very close to one. Very close. So with good good accuracy, you can you cannot make a great mistake if you say maximum quadrature component over conductor around one. Now then frequency increases and quadrature component becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. So at high frequency part of spectrum, we can practically forget about this component. And main contribution comes from in phase component. So you see opposite situation. Here, quadrature prevails at low frequency part of spectrum. And high frequency part of spectrum in phase. But there is something very, very different in both parts. This part, of sec this part of spectrum is, at least for our model, conductor in free space, is very attractive from point of measuring signal. Signal here strongly, the measure 
electromotive force, you will get strong signal. However, there is a problem. What is the problem? Who can help me? No way to distinguish conductors by tau. Tau 1 and tau 2, regardless how they are different, they will give you the same signal. Again, question of geological noise and useful signal. Ratio between geological noise and useful signal. Even signal could be very, very large. So this part of the spectrum is practically forbidden for me. There, are, there is another reason, but it's not the part of the spectrum where it's reasonable to perform service. So let us go back to low frequency part of the spectrum. I would like to find time constant. Let us solve practical problems. Suppose we have equipment and we measure quadrature in phase component. How you would suggest me to find time constant at low frequency part of spectrum? How many frequencies we have to take in order to find time constant? Because everything is around time constant. We would like to find time constant. Correct? Uh, two you suggest two frequencies and measure what? quadrature and in phase. And let us ask ourselves if we will take one frequency. Simply take one frequency. Let us start from simple case. Suppose you have quadrature component at frequency omega and in phase component at same frequency. Let us take ratio. What we will get? Hmm? Omega tau. Take ratio these two quantities, you get omega. Now, so you can, using one frequency, you can, at low frequency part of spectrum, if noise does not bother you, to find type constant. Now, let us ask ourselves how to find time constant in time domain. For example, I wrote expression for magnetic field. Z equal B naught, B naught, Z dz e minus T tau. What is your suggestion how to find time constant? So you measure field. You went to the field. You are in late stage for sure will be exponential behavior. That's field which you measure. Field or electromotive force, doesn't matter. Field. How to find time constant? At least to measure two different times. So, hmm, sorry? Correct? If you measure in two different times, you can define this time constant. Take ratio of field at two times. This coefficient disappears. This coefficient disappears. You know value ratio and your ratio of exponents, correct? Or what we are doing very often, what last yesterday you were done told you, 
Let us take logarithm from this quantity. As example, it's, it's a nothing new. It's an old good way. Logarithm bz will be equal what? Logarithm from this quantity, some constant, c minus t over tau. So if you plot graph logarithm as function time, your field, you will get at late stage, slope. And slope is equal unit divide tau. Yes, you are right. In time domain, you have to have measurements at least in two times. In frequency domain, you need only one frequency. Question arises. Why, do you, why industry at the beginning was involved in frequency domain, and then, and then decided to work in time domain? It looks like in both methods we can find time constant. Dependence on geometry, exactly the same. Let me write in more accurate way what we have in all To, in two old domains, frequency and time. We, do, we found out even time domain. We have, for example, for vertical component of the field, the same for horizontal primary field, dz coefficient which depends on geometrical factors, times e t tau. If we in frequency domain quadrature compared quadrature, according to what we wrote, I but I removed, is equal b not z, d exactly the same geometrical factor, exactly the same geometrical factors, then Omega tau, unit my omega tau, tau square. In phase companion, Bz, B not Z, exactly the same geometrical factor, only. That's all. The same dependence on geometry, the same parameter of the medium, only he in exponent, a he in fraction. For instance, we can take low frequency part of spectrum and find time constant. We can take to do it the same at any range of frequencies. Why industry practically you mining prospect mining for looking good conductors, for good good conductors, practically refused to do for example, frequency sounding in the loop. There are some people who do, no, but usually no way to compare what was 30 years ago and now. In 50s and 60s, mainly in late in West, mainly were frequency methods. And only time, with time something happens, not because there are some people who like time domain. No, there is something beneath. Let us discuss. Sorry? Mm. No problem, please. Yes, I know. I would like to answer. I ask myself it, together with you. But simply I would like to, because I do remember time when, I, uh, when frequency methods were used widely. At each point, we laid down a loop, approximately the same size, around 200, 100 meters, broad receiver, perform measurements at different frequencies, looked for frequency response of quadrature component, in phase component. It took time. Um, uh, from radio techniques, we believed if you know frequency response, you know everything. So, no questions. It was, at that time, it was the right approach. But then something happened. 
and practically all frequency methods were in mining, looking good conductor, massive for body, were replaced by time domain. It's impossible to think that's the result of a uh, special influence of some companies or some people. No, industry does not like jokes. It's, if it's better, better. If it's worse, worse. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, very, that's very simple. So there is something behind of it. On the other hand, this extremely simple example, three formulas, which practically accurate, told, tells you if you have conductor, the same dependence on geometry, the same parameter tau, only one, in one case it's somewhere in exponent, or here, in another form. So two main parameters affect field geometry, the same frequency time domain, and time constant. If somebody tells you that frequency method better in theory than time domain, or vice versa, don't believe it, because there was great, in theory, in theory, not practice, in theory, because there was great mathematician by name Fourier, who told, you have frequency response, you can calculate time response, you can do it in the opposite direction. So again, it's not reasonable to argue with great masters. However, in practice, in many cases, not always, in many cases, time domain becomes, has greater depth investigation, better ability to reduce geological noise than frequency method. And that's what I'm going to, I'm going only, I'm, I'm going to, I will start only. I will start to show you where is the problem. As soon as, so these three formulas, very simple. As soon as we have only conductor and geological noise is zero, no difference between these two methods. At all. At all. If you don't worry about geological noise, you, are, you have two equipments, frequency time domain, which have the same efficiency, the same time of performing service, two methods completely the same. If you look in this coefficient, it depends on depth. It's the same. You can, in time domain, you can define only time constant, at least here, the same here. So two parameters, they are here, the same depth investigation, the same quantity can be detected, everything the same, absolute accuracy. Otherwise, these formulas are not correct. However, something happens, and industry prefers time domain. If there are several, re there are two main reasons. One, useful reason, but not reason reasonable argument, but not principle. When you're working time domain, you measure without primary field. But there is Utam, which measures in presence of primary field. So what's the problem? Especially with time, when the electronics become stronger, strong instrumentation, better, better, better. It's not extremely important reason. In frequency domain, it's possible to measure also very small signal if you properly compensate primary field. Difference begins when we deal with geological noise. That's what I'm going to show, start to show you. <coughs> if you remember, that's late stage. Time domain is useless at early, practically always useless at early stage. As you remember, no dependence on time constant. And there is another factor surrounding medium, usually has, or not usually, always has finite resistivity, therefore skin effect, which will be discussed much later. So we are talking about time domain at late stage. Now, we don't like high frequency part of spectrum, we understand. 
So let us pay attention, low frequency particles. And compare geological noise with useful signal. Before I start to do, let me emphasize what I told already. Many, many years ago, and I, sometimes and now, you can hear, let us measure, let us measure uh, in frequency domain at many frequencies. There is no need for it. Because as I told you, time constant you can detect at one frequency. So the fact that we increase frequency, make measurements at many frequencies, never helped. Never practically helped. So now back to our lovely noise. It's not still clear. Again, two scenarios. You have two conductors. Two conductors, noise and or noise. Tau noise, tau R. Suppose tau R is greater than tau noise, as usually. Let us continue, let us perform measurements. Again, we are at low frequency part of spectrum. Please pay attention to this term. Correct? What would be the graph of the field? If it's a conductor, we measure magnetic field. So we will have some anomaly. Then, if time constant, let us say twice greater than time constant of noise, what this equation tells us? signal will be twice. Again, we didn't see this result in direct current methods. You remember, anomalies practically the same. That was happy hour in 40 years ago when this fact was realized. Geophysicists com comparing with direct current method decided, well, we are in now much better shape. Profiling methods, Schlumberger array, combined array, symmetrical, not dipole array, doesn't matter, don't, are not usually able to see, separate good conductors from poor conductors. But measuring quadrature component, it's possible to detect if time constant differ 10 times. Normally 10 times, but at the same time direct current method gave the same. That's what happens with measuring quadrature companions. So with the, I, when I tell you, I tell you about not only formulas, but about history. So that was certainly happy hour. Then geophysicists realized, realized. It's not simple to measure in phase companion, but let us try to measure at low frequency part of spectrum. What in this case happens? X distance X. We have one anomaly, and then over this body we'll have four times greater anomaly. Why? Because tau square. So at the same point, with the same frequency, going from quadrature to in phase, you can greatly improve resolution. Uh, do you remember what happens in time domain?
before going to time domain. Let us resolve one question. How frequency, when you are at low frequency part of spectrum, how frequency affects ratio between anomalies? You understand my question? Now, you are at low frequency part of spectrum. You don't want to measure at low frequency. Signal is small. You would like, you still at low frequency spectrum, omega tau less than unit, but you would like to measure here. Signal is bigger. Inductive effect is stronger. Now, my question is, this ratio for quadrature component, for phase component, how this ratio depends on frequency? how this ratio depends on value of frequency. If you look, the question is clear or not clear? You have, you, we chosen this frequency, let us say 100 gigahertz. We measure, we have anomaly at the frequency 100 gigahertz. Ratio equal, if tau r equal to tau n, ratio equal 2. Now, I reduce frequency, te reduce frequency 10 times. Create head signal becomes 10 times smaller. What happens with ratio? Hmm? Remains the same. Because over noise and over body signal proportional frequency. When you consider ratio, no, remains the same. Signal becomes smaller. But ratio remains the same. Simple example, but it opens one small secret. As soon as you are at low frequency part of spectrum, ratio between no noise and our body, if you deal co confined conductors, is the same. When we go to skin effect, you will see with decrease of frequency, skin depth increases. Depth investigation increases. I will repeat it tomorrow. You can look through Earth, but ratio between useful signal and noise remains the same. If it's not, it's bad relation, you are in trouble regardless how low frequency. Now, what happens in this case? Exactly the same story. As soon as you are in frequency, low frequency part of spectrum, ratio does not depend on frequency. That's one of the most interesting feature of low frequency part of spectrum. Now, Uh, what ha now back to time domain. So we established as soon as we are at low frequency part of spectrum, ratio the same, regardless of frequency. But what happens in time domain? Could you recall? Huh? At late time. Yeah. Yeah. What? Ratio of noise. To use the full signal? Increases. For the same numbers. So no jokes. You have the same model. You can check it in laboratory. Take a laboratory where you can and where your equipment to take two rings. Perform measurements in quadrature component. 
as soon as you low frequency part of spectrum range between anomalies is the same it's independent on the frequency you can put infinite number of frequencies it will not, not help you ratio will be the same but if you start to work with time domain equipment you remember what happened ratio between useful signal and noise does depend on time and unlike frequency at with increasing time you perform deeper deeper reduction of the noise that that's the first example i hope i will bring you mar much more practice more realistic models and show what happens but that's transition from electrical method based on direct current to frequency and from frequency to time domain this gradual improvement of ratio between useful signal and no noise was on single driving force to replace DC method by frequency, frequency by time domain. No problem to kill each method if parameters chosen improperly. Size of the loop, time of measurement, but that's a ratio between useful signal and noise is vital. Now, let me, as usually, consider with you another scenario. Again, we are in the most favorable range, low frequency part of spectrum. Our transmitter, our noise, our core body. Just a moment. Now, I wrote expression, again, a low frequency part of spectrum. Quadrature component, which we measure here, agree, equal some primary field, some coefficient. What is the coefficient I have to write here? No, uh, sorry, noise. Correct? Omega tau noise plus B not G, G or body, omega, tau, that's the field due to noise, that's the field due to body. In phase component, in phase secondary field, because we, pri let us assume primary field we can't. Now, what we have? B not Z, Z noise, and what would be here? In phase. Square. Clue plus B not Z, Z R, geometrical factor, omega tau R square. Now, we would like to detect this body. Is that correct? Yes. Your, there is discrepancy. There is some gap. No gap? No. Now, what when we will see our body? Suppose we have enough sufficiently sensitive equipment, we can measure field caused by our body. But here there is a noise. What is the right answer when we can detect? If this signal is small, relatively small, it's our screen. 
could, could be very serious obstacle. Signal caused by our body could be very strong, very measurable. But if noise is much greater, several times greater, you simply don't see even comparable if you're already in trouble. You will not see body, you will not find time constant, so everything would be wrong. Now, now let us do together some experiment. That's our noise. Tau noise, tau or body, and still tau are greater than tau noise. If a body is very deep, what would be main contribution? From what? From noise. Correct? Now I start start to approach my target or body close. Do you agree it, it could be a moment when signal from the body will be greater and you will be able to detect? That's depth investigation. Depth investigation. Now, now two scenarios. I measure quadrature or in phase. Can you either quadrature or in phase? In which case you think, let us take ratio. <coughs> ratio. In the case of quadrature, equal tau n over tau or. True? Hmm? And d. n divide d r. In the case of in phase companion, dn over d r tau n over tau r square. Question. Suppose there is there is a depth when useful signal is much greater than noise. Measuring quadrature component. Now I start to measure in phase component. When it happens, the same ratio. Back. No problem. We measure total signal. True? What we would like, that useful signal will be greater than noise. That's our desire. I started to lift my OR body. I measure quadrature component. There is a moment when this ratio becomes, let us say, 3. 1 over 3. What does it mean? Signal from OR body, 3 times more than signal from the noise. Now, my question, so there is a depth. 50 meters, when it happens. Now I start to measure in phase component. What do you think? When the same ratio I will observe? At greater depth or smaller depth? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Let us go another way. Let us take tau r, tau r over tau n equal 3. 3 I used? 4. So we have two conductors, two conductors, and tau, tau constant of deeper target is greater than Ratio, 4. Remember? 4, not 1 over 4. 4. <coughs> now, 
this is the ratio we are interested this is the ratio between you noise and useful signal true noise this is a function which characterizes effect from noise it's fixed it's fixed this function characterizes what effect from or body when i start to approach or body to surface what happens with this function what do you think that's question what happens with this function hmm? bigger bigger because it's a field stronger bigger so this is a ratio Therefore, ratio dn over dr becomes smaller. True? The same story here. But here there is coefficient proportionality, tn over tr. It does not depend on that. We choose on this ratio, tr over tn equal 4. So, in order to simplify your thinking, let us write dr dn over dr in the case of quadrature component unit divide 4 in the case of in phase component 1 over 16 <coughs> what follows from this consideration Suppose there is a moment when dr greater than dn. And for R, this say when it happens in this case much deeper much deeper and therefore in phase component has greater depth investigation usually than quadrature component so we are not talking about frequency time domain even inside frequency domain method different components have different depth investigation so let me summarize here we have a few minutes In DC methods, DC anomalies from local bodies practically the same. Up and down doesn't matter. DC. Now, frequency methods. X profile. Quadrature component gives much better ratio between useful signal and noise, which is defined by ratio time constant. We measure in phase component even much better. And now time dom, but as soon we are in low frequency part of spectrum, frequency does not help. You can measure continuously. You will get the same ratio between useful signal and noise, and depth investigation, everything would be the same for quadrature separately and in phase, but in phase usually has greater depth investigation. And now time domain. Time domain, everything defines by time for, for the same parameters of power. When it was discovered, again, it was the main reason to move in time domain. That was behind of this, and that was first examples which illustrate this fact. Let us talk here. Few more, few more words about, um, few more items about field caused by confined conductor. 
first of all, first of all, let us look at the low frequency part of spectrum again. I demonstrated that at low frequency part of spectrum, induced current, mainly quadrature component, correct? And we found out that car B, so quadrature component of the car, equal B cosine omega T, where B equal F not not pri primary flux times omega tau, correct? Let us look, what is it here? How this component arises? How does it arise in current ring? What is it? Do you remember expression for tau? Suppose you don't. Tau equal L over R. So let me place it here. And we will have F not not L. Fortunately, L and L disappears, omega. True? So our magnitude of quadrature component, which is measured very often in all electron, I would say all this is measured, except methods where amplitude in phase, is equal simply F not not divided by R times omega. So quadrature component is, is proportional frequency and proportional to what? What is conductivity? Now, how does it arise? We discuss it once, but I would like to show you again in order to make it clear. Let us assume for a second that frequency is low enough, it could be megahertz. We are talking low frequency part of spectrum. Relatively low enough that induced current in the ring is small. Therefore, please try to follow me, that's current in transmitter sinus omega g. Correct? Let us assume, only assume, frequency is low enough, induced current is small, therefore its magnetic field is small, therefore, <coughs> therefore let us neglect by flux of secondary field with respect to flux primary field. Therefore, electromotive force, which will arise in our ring, will be equal minus primary flux dt. True? Physics is very important. That's an excellent example when formals and approximation give the same result, but approximation comes from physics. So, how our, we know our primary flux is equal F not not sinus omega t. You remember, because current and transmitter changes sinus omega t, its magnetic field changes sinus omega t, flux is simply sum changes sinus omega t, therefore electromotive force, can we take derivative from this very complicated expression? Let us do it. F not not, what else I have to write? Do we need to take derivative? from sinus omega t, it will be derivative from sinus omega t. Hmm? Omega cosine omega t. Hmm? 
derivative from sinus omega cosine omega t now tell me please its exact expression or behind of this expression assumption I go back is it exact expression that's real electromotive for in the ring or we neglected by something My we neglected by what by secondary magnetic field it also creates flux we discussed yesterday but if frequency relatively small relatively small we can neglect by secondary flux and therefore electromotive force is equal simply minus a for Faraday's law rate of change primary flux so we found expression now first of all electromotive force changes with time in phase with current in transmitter or no it's shifted by he assigned this omega t here you did you took derivative cosine omega t so electromotive in our approximation electromotive force is shifted by 90 degree now now I would like to find current induced current what we have to do with electromotive force divide by R resistance do you recognize minus F not not divide by R omega cosine omega t that's our magnitude so as soon as frequency is relatively slow always without any exception we don't care about shape of the body its conductivity whether it's confined conductor or it's overburden or horizontal air medium physics must tell you if frequency is low in any current in any conducting ring main part due to primary field therefore if current in transmitter changes sinus omega t electromotive force will be derivative Faraday's law it means proportional omega it will be quadrature component cosine omega t divide by r it means proportional to conductivity that's iron rule for all low frequency methods I understand Dante will tell you about uh, M31, M34 I would be happy we had more time to tell you about one of the powers, powerful method in logging, induction logging again is based on this assumption it's very simple to calculate current there is no any theory, no equations it's a, you calculate it current then use Biosavar law and it will be resolved what is important? we always know where is our transmitter therefore we know our primary field therefore we always know primary flux it does not depend on medium F not primary flux so only divide by resistance of your current ring and you got current then use Biosavar law in any class as in any textbook it's written and you will calculate magnetic field so it's, it's a extremely useful approximation that's what I wanted to tell you when I mention always at low frequency part of spectrum quadrature component prevails it's caused by primary field you neglect by secondary that shows you that current and there, therefore field caused by this current must be proportional conductivity and frequency so it's not frequency response which I gave you hour ago some special case it's universal no exception now just a second now let me do the following I 
I gave you, without proof, you should believe me, expression for any companion in time domain caused by currents in uh, <coughs> confined conductor. It's equal, be not a primary field, sum, you have this expression, you don't need to write, e minus t over tau n. You remember? All this is correct. It's a very simple expression. Sum of exponents. Similar expression is valid in frequency domain. For instance, quadrature companion magnetic field, any frequency equal B not A, sum, sum, D and A, omega tau, n unit plus omega square tau n square in phase component all this equal b not a sum d n l omega tau n square unit the same coefficients describe field the same functions describe field in frequency domain and time domain. Now, <coughs> of course, in order to find it, it's necessary to solve boundary value problem. But that's not subject for our discussions, today at least. Uh, Let me leave this subject only, only in order to remove me, because I'm going to give physics skin effect. I would like to explain you, you're tired with noise, with my noise, it's useful signal. Uh, but let us summarize only one fact. I would uh, summarize uh, what I told before. I would like to emphasize only one fact. If you have one conductor and you don't have geological noise, do believe that frequency in time domain is equivalent. Everybody who tells it they are not equivalent, it's nonsense. It means they argue with physics, with integral Fourier, etc., etc., etc. Now, however, difference of these three set of methods, even four, I would say. DC method, measurements quadrature in frequency domain, measurement in phase component in frequency domain, and time domain, they are become completely different when we have geological noise. That's what main was my main goal of these discussions. Now, now I would like to describe you one phenomenon which I didn't describe. Extremely important. Skin effect. Let us discuss it. We will forget about noise, about electrical methods, and back to physics. We will neglect by propagation, since in most cases we don't deal with propagation methods, don't deal with propagation. So let us consider arbitrary conductor. Conductor. Let me take a loop and assume here non-conductor. And suppose that's very important what I'm going to suppose there is one very important feature behavior of current in transmitter. Suppose it's step function. That's behavior. It's a bit it's awful picture. For me it's awful. Our transmitter. 
Suppose we had constant current, then we abruptly stop current, and question arises, what happens in this conductor? So our subject is skin effect. Condition, two conditions, step function and non-conducting medium. Arbitrary conductor, what would happen? What do you think? Conductor, it means salt water, it means piece of rock, it means metal. Please don't think when, uh, uh, in order to remove again confusion, when I say conductor, I don't think necessarily metal. I ionic conductor, metal conductor, what would happen in this case? Where? Hmm? Inside of conduct. Huh? Or, sorry? Outside or inside? Well, for instance, I have here a transmitter. It creates a constant magnetic field. At each point, there is magnetic field B0. At each point, it's different at this point, at this point, at this. It changes. It could change arbitrary. But now, let us turn off car. Not a sinusoid. No. Abrupt. Step function. And then we will deal with very important phenomenon, which you gave me explanation. Thank you very much. At the first moment, current in transmitter does not ex already does not exist, correct? Somewhere very close to this point. Time. But what happens inside? Magnetic field will remain the same. Will remain the same. How it's possible? I remove transmitter. I cut again by scissors, instantly. But magnetic field remains at the first moment the same. What creates magnetic field? Currents. So somewhere currents must arise. And they arise, as you suggested me correctly, on the surface. They rise on the surface in such clever way. We don't know how they rise, but we know only one fact: car to several facts. Currents don't arise inside of conductor. No. They arise only on the surface, which between transmitter and conductor. Everywhere. They could be distributed very complicated way, but they have only one function. At the first moment, preserve inside the same magnetic field as was before. This phenomenon, it's a skin effect and nothing else. Nothing, nothing else. Now, so, induced currents arise. At each point, they must preserve the same magnetic field. Now, suppose I have another step function in this way. What would happen in this way? You follow me? It's a current in transmitter that's zero. Here we turn off current. Now I would like to turn on current. What would happen in this place, case? Correct. Induced currents again arise at 
surface, but now their goal to kill this magnetic field because before we didn't have magnetic field. So goal is to preserve magnet magnetic field which was before. So that's skin effect. Now let me give you another example. You have Earth or body, excellent or body, conductivity 10 resins. Now, here resistivity 100 ohm ohmmeter. That's not fair to use what one place resistivity, another conductivity. So, resistivity 10 minus 3, here 100 ohm ohmmeters. I have transmitter overburden another resistor here 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer, doesn't matter so complicated geological section now I turn off current what would happen current on the surface on, on the surface or body or on the surface of with air on interface here, here it's a beautiful conductor it's a five orders difference of resistivity sorry? on all interfaces no iron rule we discuss about we only start to, to discuss here transmitter non-conducting medium currents arise only on the surface between transmitter and conductor and here non-conductor when I told uh, mentioned about this phenomenon I didn't tell you that medium could be non-uniform or uniform doesn't matter iron rule you turn off current don't care whether it's metal salt uniform, non-uniform, 10 layers, 20 fractions. Currents don't know anything about it. They arise on the surface and have one function. Preserve magnetic field the same as was before. Now, let me give you another example. So when we shut off uh, turn off current in the loop on the earth surface for instance that's we will not take geonix equipment we will take serotap Australian equipment ok yes you agree Good. so uh, serotap we turn off current loop on the soil no distance where induced current arise. So suppose we have again, just a second, let me make picture better. Today I started to to to, to like this. <coughs> so surface, layered medium, loop current changes in this way. So when current is constant, we have magnetic field caused by this current loop. Clear? Now, we turn off current. What happens? Inst instantly, for us, instantly, because we neglected by displacement current. Instantly, current arises exactly beneath loop at this point but now it flows not inside of wire but in the soil moreover in this case current must preserve the same magnetic field we had in the loop current 10 ampere I promise you exactly 
beneath almost at the same place, still you have at the first moment 10 ampere. Since current is the same, in the same place, magnetic field also the same. Now, and it doesn't matter what are the levels. When we have transmitter a little above for some reason, small coil, then current arises mainly in some area near surface, some area, not everywhere, maximum currents. Just a moment, let me make picture better. Well, that's if, if you would like to see density of induced current, it's somewhere here, maximum above, and then it's spread. But its distribution is such that magnetic field at the first moment remains the same. It doesn't matter how many boundaries, what kind of medium we have. That's what we have in time domain method, by the way. That's what happens at the first moment. Now, uh, what happens in this case if I have turned on? Nothing, only direction, as you suggested. Direction of current will be opposite, because we, now we have current in transmitter 10 ampere. So we must have at the same place current minus 10 ampere. Then total current will be zero in no magnetic field as before. Now, let me ask you another question. Borehole. Layers. Mat. Row 1, row 2, row 3. You are in borehole. You have coil, many coil, turn coil. You turn off current, suppose, suppose here. Somewhere you have earth surface, many layers, or body I forgot to put here. Uh, where at the first moment current arrives. Near transmitter. Near transmitter loop. Exactly around of mm, uh, surface of the wire. Now, that's sometimes it called internal skin effect. Doesn't matter. Skin effect is the same. At the first moment, only not sinusoid, not impulse, step function. <laughs> step function. Then currents always arise near surface of transmitter. That's the beginning of their life. And what we are doing in our electromagnetic time domain, time domain, we watch how these currents are distributed in the time inside of the medium. For example, at the first moment, I hope it's all just a second. Oh, that's our body. At the first moment, when you turn off current, no currents in a our body. Our body does not feel anything. You get information at the first gates, the first initial times, only about soil or upper layer. Then time will come when they will see effect of the conductor. Instrument which is a very good example of some of the um, some of the principles that Alex was describing this afternoon. Before doing that, I'll review, as Alex did, the factors that affect the conductivity of a soil sample, because these devices are near surface devices, mostly used in environmental geophysics, um, and so uh, mostly used in unconsolidated materials. Um, as probably many of you are aware, in s most soils, virtually all soils, the actual soil particles themselves are electrical insulators, and the current flow in the soil sample is through the soil moisture, the soil water. 
And so the soil water has a very strong effect on the conductivity of the sample. Basically, um, I've, I've sketched out here Archie's law, which works um, moderately well. I, when I say moderately well, we think it works moderately well for most saturated soils. I've only seen one article which discussed in detail, and that was in Sands, where it, where it was shown to work really very well. Um, Archie's law tells us that this, if we take a saturated sample of soil and measure the electrical conductivity of it, the apparent conductivity, I might add Archie's law is heuristically derived, there's no theoretical base for it, that the conductivity consists of two components. Uh, the first component is proportional to the porosity of the medium raised to a power m. The porosity factor is obvious. The more porous the soil is, since we've assumed it's saturated, the, the uh, more moisture we have through which the current will flow. The factor m is, is called a shape factor, and it depends basically on the, on the nature of the particles, whether, for example, they're essentially spherical, or whether, as in shell fragments, they might turn out to be rather platy. This quantity, the formation factor, is multiplied by the conductivity of the soil water. Alex discussed in good detail the factors that affect the conductivity of the water. It's, of course, ionic conduction caused by the various ions that you find in the soil moisture. Um, one important factor is that most of the ions that are found commonly have roughly the same mobilities. As he pointed out, the conductivity is dictated by the ionic mobility. And therefore, the conductivity is relatively independent, usually, of the type of ions that you have, be they chlorides, sulfates, whatever. The exception to that, of course, is the hydrogen ion, which is much more mobile and a small amount of acids in the groundwater will greatly enhance the conductivity. And that's why when we show the lab experiments of breaking down water, we pop a little sulfuric acid into the sample. This then is our first component, uh, one more point only, and that is that the conductivity of soils is temperature dependent. And the reason for that is that the conductivity of the water is temperature dependent, and the reason for that is that the mobilities are temperature dependent, and the variability is of the order of 2% per degree Celsius for the mobility. And that's quite a big change. It's much, much bigger, for example, than you get uh, for the temperature coefficient of metallic um, conductors. If you have, as we easily get in North America, a factor of 20 degrees Celsius between summer and winter conditions, that gives you a 40 degrees Celsius change in conductivity, and you really see it. Um, the final contribution is that from clays, it's variable. It depends on what's called the cation exchange capacity of clays. Uh, most clays tend to be to have a relatively low contribution to the conductivity. Some clays, such as Montmorillonite, have very high CEC, and, uh, and consequently, they're quite evident when you're making measurements because the bulk conductivity can be significantly affected by them. So then the factors are, as outlined here, plus temperature. Obviously, if we uh, desaturate the sample, and we have gas bubbles, they act as electrical insulators as well, and so they tend to drive the conductivity down. Okay, these instruments, as I say, obey the physics that Alex described this afternoon. Basically what we do is we take a transmitter, I'll show you some pictures of equipment, and it consists of a coil usually of 50 to 100 turns, and the coil is energized with an oscillator at frequencies of the order of 1,000 to 10,000 hertz. Um, the primary current alternating at 1,000 hertz, for example, generates, as we by now know very well, an alternating primary field in the ground. 
should the ground be conductive, the uh, Faraday's law says that there will be an EMF induced, roughly as shown, for example, and that it will try to drive a current flow in the ground. We can, as did Alex for his confined conductors, think of the current loops in the ground as still having resistance and inductance. And in general, with a uh, transmitter receiver system of this sort, the secondary field, which is generated by these currents and picked up by the receiver, is a quite complicated function of frequency. That is the frequency of the transmitter, the conductivity of the ground, and the distance s at which the measurement is made from the transmitter. As Alex suggested this afternoon, not suggested, said, if we drive the frequency down to uh, small values, we can make the effect of this reactive term disappear compared with the actual resistance in the, in the current loop. And this is achieved, again, just by running at very low frequencies. And technically, uh, we call it operation at, what, at low values of induction number, and Alex will describe more about that later. The, there's a second point which occurs when you run these systems at very low frequencies, and that is that if you have two current loops, and of course you do, as the frequency drops to very low values, not only does this, the effect of the self-inductance of each of these loops vanish, but the mutual inductance between two current loops vanishes. In essence, each loop of current sees only the alternating primary magnetic field. Its own flux is negligible compared with the original primary field. The flux from all other loops is also negligible. And that has a really interesting effect because it means that these current loops are blind to the existence of each other. Each current loop flows um, in a manner dictated by the local conductivity and, of course, the local flux. Is that kind of the of the flux that like be almost a backing that's going to be blind to each other? Yeah, in essence, yes. Um, the, um, you know, this is a simple picture uh, that the, the electrical engineer likes to see. Of course, you don't have currents. You have current density, and, and, and you don't have current rings. But the answer is yes. The current density at any point is independent of the current density beneath it or inside of it. So yeah. And that, that makes these devices very useful, because if we have a layered Earth, and I've shown here, for example, a thin sheet conductor, which might be a sheet of soil, something of that sort. Um, and if we have another sheet down here, the, the, the current flow in each is in totally independent of the current flow in any others. So that if we want to ask the question, how does the sensitivity of such a system vary with depth, it's easily answered. We just postulate a thin sheet conductor. Uh, we start with it up here. We calculate the response. And then we just keep moving it down, 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 down. And we calculate the response as a function of depth. And we learn that for the coil configuration that I've shown, that the response as a function of depth looks something like this. I should go back and mention before discussing this in any detail that the fact that the inductive reactances of each loop and the mutual inductances are negligible means that the current flow in each loop is determined solely by the loop resistance, again as discussed by Alex, for confined bodies. He mentioned also that it's true for unconfined bodies. And that means that the magnitude of current that flows in each of these loops is dictated solely by the conductivity that the loop encounters. It also means, again, as described by Alex, that because the flux is 90 degrees out of phase with the current in the transmitter, and these small currents are in phase with the 
voltage generators, if you like, arising from the changing magnetic field, that the current flow in the ground will be in quadrature phase with the current flow in the transmitter. So our receiver will see basically two fields. It will see the very large primary field arising directly from the transmitter, BP. By now this figure is getting a bit complicated. And, it, uh, and that also, of course, was the field which was inducing the currents in the ground. It will also see the much smaller magnetic field, the secondary magnetic field, arising from the subsurface current flow. Should the ground be homogeneous, it's a fairly straightforward matter to calculate the measured quantity, which is the ratio of the secondary to the primary field. It's given by this expression here. The I, of course, dictate, denotes that the response is in quadrature phase. It's proportional to the frequency of operation. Turns out to be proportional to the square of the intercoil spacing and is proportional, proportional to the conductivity of the ground. If we measure this quantity then, we can invert it and express an apparent conductivity of the ground as 4 over omega mu s squared bs over bp, the quadrature phase component. And so these devices are direct reading in ground conductivity, as it were. I mentioned here that uh, that we could easily determine how the response fell with depth. And, um, uh, and I suggested that for this coil configuration, the response looks like this. It turns out, as with all EM calculations, that the important parameter is the depth divided by the skin depth in this medium. The operation of low induction number means that we want to always operate the system at small values of intercoil spacing in terms of the skin depth. The underlying physics assumes that the skin depth is always much larger than our intercoil spacing, and that means that the fall off of the fields in the substrate, the primary magnetic field, is dictated, or as far as we're concerned, by the geometry of the system rather than by the electrical properties of the medium, i.e. rather than by the skin depth. And that means that if, for example, we double the frequency, naturally one would say, the other day we, we discussed magnetotelluric sounding where in order to do soundings we varied the frequency. That would raise the question, can we do soundings with a system of this sort by varying the frequency, and the answer is no. When this quantity is always much less than one, in other words, the intercoil spacing is much less than a skin depth, it turns out that as we raise or lower the frequency, all we do is directly and linearly raise and lower the voltage out of the receiver coil. There is no information in the low induction number approximation to be derived by changing the frequency. If you want to change the, uh, the depth, you have to change the intercoil spacing, so-called parametric sounding instead of frequency sounding. My curve here then showed me that the, um, I certainly wrote something incorrectly there, that should be Z, Z over S for the approximation to be valid. Uh, the, again, skin depth doesn't come into it once we choose the spacing to be much less than a skin depth. The, um, as, as we increase the depth compared to the intercoil spacing, the sensitivity initially increases. The response is zero to the material very, no, very near the surface. It increases as we go down in the medium, becoming a maximum at about 0 0.4 intercoil spacings. Thereafter, the response falls off again, monotonically decaying to zero. 
Um, uh, well, you can look at Alex's books. We actually did this before we knew Alex stumbling around, but Alex has the calculations. Alex in frequency and transient sounding. Okay, geometrical factor in there. Induction loading by Dole. There is a very specific, very useful concept, which is basis of all induction loading. Then of and in, the, in all my books, in induction loading book, in frequency transient mm -hmm. soundings, and even in this book, uh, green. But frequency transient and induction and severe is separate uh, books. Uh, also, there are part B or part C. In part C, there are expressions mm -hmm. for both. Mm -hmm. It's for Good. both. Good. For, for, for genetic contact and it is not It's safe to say, I guess, Alex, that the, the, the actual calculations are reasonably involved to calculate the geometric factors. I say they are. It's reasonable to say that the calculations are involved. Okay, Alex says they're simple. No, no compares, it's elementary function, radicals, no integrals, no derivatives. It's a no solution for the problems. <laughs> That's the power of your... Okay. <laughs> Or problems can be done using small calculate, calculate, not computer. Even by hand. Okay. Well, um, they, you know, they, they, now you know where to find it and also how to do it. And it, the results at any rate are really straightforward. You end up with a simple plot that looks like this, which uh, which gives you the relative sensitivity with depth. It turns out that if you change the coil configuration from the vertical dipole mode to the horizontal dipole mode, that you change the current distribution in the ground, and you also change the relative sensitivity with depth. And the new curve for the horizontal dipole mode of operation looks like this and compares with the vertical dipole mode. When um, we compare the two curves, we see that by lifting them up and putting them on their sides, that we now have large sensitivity to the near surface material and that the, um, uh, the sensitivity decays monotonically with depth. Uh, this gives us a useful way of, of telling very quickly and reasonably accurately whether the earth is layered. We simply make a measurement of the apparent conductivity in the vertical mode of operation. We then flip the coils over like this, changing quite substantially the weighting to each of the layers in the ground. If we get the same value of apparent conductivity, then we know that the ground is reasonably uniform down to depths of the order of 60 or 70 percent of the intercoil spacing. If when we do this the conductivity falls, we know that in this mode of operation we're very sensitive to the near surface. The conductivity fell, that means that the near surface material was less conductive. If we do that and the conductivity goes up, we know that the near surface conductivity is more conductive. We obviously also have the, um, the uh, facility, if we'd like, to move the coils apart to get greater depth. In fact, in the equipment which we build, um, we've restricted the intercoil spacings to three factors of two apart. And the reason we do that is that there's a dynamic range problem with the equipment because of the cube law fall off of the primary field, it would be nicer. And the obvious question is, why don't you just have a lot of intercoil spacings? And it turns out you'd have quite a lot of electronics to do. Um, basically, the devices are very simple, and they're designed basically as geologists' instruments, so that a geologist 
can go out and map with one of these devices. He doesn't have to know a lot of geophysics. It helps if he knows a lot of geology because he'll very quickly learn how to interpret, usually he'll quickly learn how to interpret the data in terms of the, um, in terms of the geology that he sees or suspects exists. Alex was mentioning earlier that we can either, with a device of this sort, measure phase and amplitude, or we can measure in-phase and quadrature phase components. I mentioned that electrical engineers much prefer, yeah? I'm not totally speaking about what you're about before. No problem. With the increasing of the spacing, how close can you approach the skin depth before our assumption? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. What we do as we increase the spacing is we drop the frequency. Otherwise, exactly that would happen. And as we get increased it, we'd start to roll out of the induction num low induction number approximation. And so in order to stay in it, as we increase the spacing, we change the frequency. In order to stay in this approximation, you'll notice that we have to, if we uh, double the intercoil spacing, we have to drop the frequency by four. And the net result is that by the time you're building an instrument with a 40 meter intercoil spacing, you're running at 400 hertz, which is fairly low, and starting to get into power line noise and that sort of thing. That's, that's one of the limits. The, um, again, we measure in phase and quad phase. Why do we love those, uh, those components? It's simple. Here is our transmitter. Here's, the transmit, here's our transmitter loop, the transmitter itself, and we take a reference off the transmitter which lets us know what the transmitter uh, current is doing. The magnetic field from the receiver, again, consists of a huge big component from the primary field and a much smaller, and I show here, for example, that in a thousand ohm meter material, that the secondary field is, um, uh, a few parts in 10,000 of the primary field. These instruments are difficult to build because they are frequency domain. You have to buck out the primary field, which is very large, and you also have to measure secondary fields at part per million levels of the primary field, to 300 parts per million, granted, but it turns out that when you get down to those levels, even though you're measuring quadrature phase signals, there are lots of parameters in the, in the circuitry, some of which are poorly understood, shielding and that sort of thing, which start to become temperature dependent, and it's difficult to, uh, to achieve long-term stability much better than that. To return to the I and Q question, here's our phase reference, here's our receiver coil, a preamplifier, and I then send the signal, I split it, and I send it into two multipliers. And these multipliers are just that. They're gates, basically, alternating gates. You'll note that the drive for one of my multipliers has been shifted by 90 degrees with respect to the drive of the other. Let's have a look at what happens. Suppose that this is the voltage out of the receiver coil, sinusoidal. And let's suppose that this is my first multiplier. This is the one that hasn't been phase shifted. It's simply um, a gate which flips the polarity of the signal that it sees coming out of the receiver every alternate cycle. And the net result of multiplying this by this is that. It basically rectifies the signal. These things are actually called synchronous detectors or synchronous rectifiers. And if we measure the amplitude of this thing after doing a little filtering to get rid of the ripple, we will have an output which is directly proportional to the amplitude of that. My second synchronous detector, our multiplier, has been shifted by 90 degrees. And here, very carefully drawn, is a device which has been shifted by 90 degrees, in other words, a quarter of a period. With respect to this multiplier, now if I multiply the sinusoid by this gate, I get this. And you'll see that the DC of that is zero, 
And therefore, this, which is going to be my quadrature phase, I'll assume the signal's all in phase, this output will be zero. If I start phase shifting this signal, i.e. sliding it down the time axis, the output of this one will start to fall, the output of this one will start to increase. One is proportional to the cosine of the phase angle, one to the sine of the phase angle. Those are obviously very easy devices to build, and that's why we like I and Q. Okay, what are the problems with these systems? And for sure they have some. The um, most serious one is the question of linearity. The, um, ideally, if we plotted the log of true conductivity, and I'm assuming a homogeneous half space against the, uh, plot the log of apparent conductivity against log of true conductivity, we would get a straight line with a slope of 45 degrees. At very low values of conductivity, we just run out a signal. As the conductivity gets very low, the signal just disappears in the noise. So at low values of conductivity, we can't make a measurement. And it turns out that that value of conductivity is not necessarily that low. It's of the order of, and we use millisiemens per meter, it's of the, which is a, a millisiemen per meter, of course, is 10 to the minus 3 siemens per meter. The lowest value that we can measure is of the order of 1 to 2 millisiemens per meter. So if you have resistive ground, these devices simply don't work at all. They just don't read anything. The other problem occurs at high values of conductivity where we run out of the low induction number approximation. And what happens there is that our desired response would look like that. In fact, it starts to saturate and unpleasantly even more, it eventually drops down and changes sign. So that these devices have a definite upper limit beyond which they can't be used. And that upper limit depends really on the length of the instrument. For a short instrument, it's easy to use them in the low induction number approximation up to high values of conductivity. As you make the instrument bigger and bigger, it tends to get into the saturation more quickly. So they have a limited range over which you can use them. I don't want to use the word cheap or quick and nasty, but basically they're fast reconnaissance instruments. You can't do a lot of uh, detailed interpretation of the data. Um, but you know, geophysicists will complain about that. Basically you, you have a value of apparent conductivity. You can roll the instrument over and see whether it's increasing or decreasing with depth. Uh, you can increase, increase the intercoil spacing and do a very crude sounding. You only have three data points. Um, basically, that's about it. That notwithstanding, they're probably now the most popular EM tool worldwide. We, you know, we've sold about a thousand of these things. I'm sorry to. Obviously, the geonics makes them. I'm sorry to keep saying we, but anyway, it's, it's a fact of life. We sold over a thousand of them, and the, the next biggest EM device that's out in the market is, funnily enough, VLF. It was very, very popular years ago. Less so now, and basically because of the interest in environmental geophysics, uh, these things have become widely used. Yeah. Would you use it maybe in a mine environment? Or? No, these are. In, I'll, sh I'll show you about 40 nice case histories okay. to show you how you can use it. Uh, it's quarter to four. I'll keep you a little while. But basically, yes, you can use them in mines. You can use them for shallow exploration. Um, you know, they they work for detecting. They work for trenching, for example. Uh, their depth of exploration in EM31, with its 12-foot intercoil spacing, has a depth of exploration 
Uh, we, we say that the depth of exploration is about one and a half times the intercoil spacing, which for a 12 foot long EM31 means you can go down about 18 feet, six meters, something of that sort. Yeah, they're exactly the same. They're not the, the helicopter systems in fact are longer and they don't work in low induction number approximation. They, they'll work at higher frequencies. But basically the devices are virtually the same apart from that. These are much simpler. The HEM ones are now strewn with coils. So, Okay, um, I've covered most of the points. Um, there's the expression for the uh, response in the event that you're not working at low induction numbers. And Alex, I don't know if you say that's compl complex or not. Uh, it's <laughs> I'll tell you it's reasonably complex because on a couple of occasions I've had people phone up from universities around the U.S. wanting to know how we can simplify this expression to this one. And it takes a, a reasonable amount of work. You have to go into the uh, small parameters and keep a lot of terms. Let me just put this line down the screen. Whoever did this is not a sailor. <laughs> Okay, the slides are clear enough to see. Okay. Um, one other point which I should mention, and that is, uh, and I discussed this yesterday a bit, um, these devices also, they measure both the in phase and the quadrature phase outputs. And we use the in phase output, for example, of an EM31 to measure the presence of buried metal. If you have a buried steel drum, uh, as you go over it with these devices, you actually induce localized vortex currents in the drum. And because these devices are so conductive, you get a strong in-phase signal. And it tends to look just like your classic sling ram response. And because the in-phase output is insensitive as a rule to the conductivity of the ground, you usually see these devices actually going negative, the response going negative. You also get a smaller output on the conductivity output on the quadrature phase output, same sort of signal. And you get if the same response if you go over a conductive fault. Remember I showed you yesterday and I described it as a problem, which it is, to vertical dipole systems where the intercoil spacing is larger than the anomaly, you get this, this response here. In our case, it's an advantage because you can use these devices for looking for structure. Okay, this is the small one meter unit, uh, which was designed basically for soil salinity. Soil salinity, as you all know, is a big problem, both in Western Australia and in the Murray River Basin. This device has the two coils one meter apart, and it has a depth of exploration of about one and a half meters. It's being used there for an archeological survey. This is the EM31, 12 feet intercoil spacing, depth of exploration, 18 feet. And uh, this guy is demonstrating that you can use a, uh, an EM31 with snow on the surface, for example, it doesn't bother it. It may bother the operator a bit. <laughs> you have to recall that he's still measuring conductivity all the way down. <laughs> and this is the EM34 here being used in the horizontal dipole mode um, with an intercoil spacing of 10 meters. 
and there the coils are in the vertical dipole mode. And you can also sling them from underneath the vehicle and race around the countryside doing automatic conductivity measurements until you drive into the first um, small hill. Okay, this is an example of um, a survey done with the EM31 and it, it illustrates the um, some of the features of the instrument and what you can do with it. The, um, the survey is done in New York State and it's basically as most of the surveys that I'll show you are a contamination, a groundwater contamination study. The survey area which is a few hectares uh, was used um, for a waste storage and recovery quote unquote plant and um, what we show here are shaded is a shaded relief map of contours of apparent conductivity we saw over here that the conductivity of a soil is proportional to the conductivity of the soil water if you dunk enough or, uh, inorganic goop into the soil water it's usually not too difficult to start to see the bulk conductivity of the soil increase. One of the advantages of the inductive EM over conventional resistivity is that by virtue of the bio law again, your received magnetic field is arising from a large number of current loops. It tends to be very free from geological noise. As you walk along with one of these devices, you can detect small changes in conductivity of the order of 1%, if you like, of the background value. Now, that's not very often useful, but if you're trying to look for deep conductive plumes, for example, it is very useful. It's also useful for archaeological applications where you can actually contour the data to levels of the order of a quarter of a millisiemen per meter. And you can see very, very faint features which in the case of conventional resistivity would be lost in the geological noise um, resulting from your use of electrodes. Uh, the survey itself is done with lines, I've forgotten how far apart they are, the scale here is 0 to 20 feet so they look like uh, 10 feet over most of the survey line. Another advantage of the devices, of course, is that you can measure the conductivity as you're walking. You don't have to stop to do the measurement. And so what we do with them is to put a digital data logger on the devices, and it automatically is triggered at a preset interval, uh, typically one second. So what you do to survey a line is usually lay out a tape down the line and you'll take your least favorite tape and you'll, you'll put paint marks on it every 10 meters or something of that sort. And as you survey down the line, trying to keep your speed as constant as possible, there's a button on the instrument which lets you put a fiducial on the data every time you go over one of those 10 meter marks. And the data reduction program then corrects within those 10 meter marks for any variations in walking speed, it just linearly stretches the data or shrinks it to be uniform within the 10 meter interval. What, what about putting on a, a cotton string? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, um, have you ever used one? Uh, yeah, <laughs> well that's why we use the tape with marks on it. <laughs> but, but, they, but they are used, well, you know, they're, and, and they're, of course they're more accurate. But um, no, and you can also, of course, just take the measurements on a point by point basis. But the point is that if you do it continuously, you get really, really, really well resolved data. And you know, my, my experience in geophysics, which is 20 odd years, is that the more data, the better. You know, better resolution looks better, better resolution usually is better. The program that we're using to um, show the data here is, is, is um, yeah, um, and it's, of course, their data is, was basically derived for airborne systems, and, um, and we're able to use their airborne packages on the ground. It's very easy with this system by walking the survey area to generate 20 or 30,000 data points in a day. So you have a lot of data, and you need a fairly fast data manipulation package. 
We really like it because of the fact that it has the shaded relief maps, which, which, which give very attractive looking data. So what you see here, the background um, conductivities are of the order of 15, 16 millisiemens per meter. They're the greens, and that's typical of the till in this area. The areas that you see in red are conductivities going up to 40, 50, and 60 millisiemens per meter. Now, there's nothing ordained by God in conductivity and whether or not you've got a contaminant um, that will show, for example, depends on the background conductivity. If you're working in 150 millisiemen per meter material and you add 10 or 20, 30 millisiemens per meter, it will be much more difficult to see than in a more resistive background. One of the reasons that we like conductivity rather than resistivity is that conductivity goes up linearly with the amount of contaminant that you add. The small blue spots that you see, the localized spots, are those little depressions caused by buried metal. Okay, so basically that's what a ground conductivity map looks like. Um, that's what you deliver to the customer along with some wise words as to what the blue probably is and what the red is. Because, uh, of course, all geophysics has done is to tell him where you think he should put his monitoring wells. And in these areas here, the obvious locations for monitoring wells are in the conductivity highs. And basically the interpretation is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, this is another survey done in the roughly the same area. The conductivities are lower. It's a thin veneer of sand lying on top of dolomite. And you can see lots of buried metal. And you can also see conductivity highs, which turned out to be um, um, ash that had been deposited there. It's another industrial contamination site. And again, you can tell the hydrologist basically where you think he should pop yeah. in it. Yeah. One of the ripple effects, are they light effects or is that some sort of fraction? These things here? Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good question. They're real and uh, <laughs> you know that's where the geologist comes in. They they look as if they look as if they're geological. As I say, the depth of the dolomite, the overburden thickness is only a couple of meters, so they may well be. This is one of our favorite sites. This is a parking lot that was going to be developed. And um, a uh, contractor went in and popped five monitoring wells in the parking lot and, uh, and found some contamination, but not enough to worry about. And basically, they were going to dig the thing up and take the soil in for treatment. It's about a one hectare site, and, a, and the estimated cost of doing it was about um, a million bucks. Uh, the owners decided to run a 31 over it, and this shows the conductivity map, which is um, not, not that obvious in this format. It was replotted, no, the in phase data was replotted as a shaded relief map. And, and you obviously start to see some, some interesting details in there. And um, the next slide shows what the interesting details were. The site had been a fuel recovery storage, fuel storage site with, you know, 50,000 gallon tanks and, and there was lots of fuel still there and the, the cost for recovering the, the tanks and cleaning.